Thank you for joining us for the third and final day of the Reading Matters Conference. I have the pleasure of introducing the speakers on our first panel today, entitled Reading Climaxes, High Points of Close Reading, Professor Katrin Pal from Johns Hopkins University and Professor Gail Solomon from Princeton. Katrin Pal is Associate Professor in the Department of German and Romance Languages and Literatures and the co-director of the Program for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality at Johns Hopkins University. Paul approaches the German literary and philosophical canon from a queer feminist perspective, situated in affect and emotion studies. She is the author of Tropes of Transport, Hegel and Emotion, and Sex Changes with Kleist. Paul was awarded the Best Article in Feminist Scholarship Prize from the Coalition of Women in German for her piece, Transformative Translations, Serializing and Queering. Faced with the dilemma of representing without reducing, embodying without disembodying, Katrin Paul turned to the work of Heinrich von Kleist. It is Kleist's anachronism, as he writes in the beginning of the 19th century, that renders, quote, Kleist's queer notion of language, urgent for queer theory today, his joining of the, quote, apparent messiness of the world with messy thoughts and messy utterances. As Paul quotes from Kleist the Broken Jug in a deliberately chaotic translation of the German Unentwan, quote, suppose the matter here, as I'm afraid it may, remains undisentangled. The queer potential of Kleist's work is contained in this resistance to reductive representation, whether it be the refusal to manage messiness or the striking through of an unspeakable violence. With this reading, Paul demonstrates, quote, how sex might change if we learn with Kleist to see what has long remained invisible and to speak to what could continue to remain unintelligible, queer female sexuality and queer procreation. In her talk today, entitled Transorgasmics, Paul will demonstrate how and why close reading can reach its high points. Through a reading of Kleist's The Broken Jug as improperly overlaying several different dramas, Paul will show that it is a play with multiple climaxes. Paul's talk will be followed by res with a response by Gail Solomon, in which Solomon will consider the ways in which Paul's close reading sheds light on larger questions of reading practices and the matters at hand. Gail Solomon is professor of English and Gender and Sexuality Studies at Princeton. She works in phenomenology, queer and transgender theory, feminist philosophy, 20th century continental philosophy, psychoanalysis, and disability studies. Her first book, Assuming a Body, Transgender and Rhetorics of Materiality, was winner of the 2011 Lambda Literary Award in LGBT studies. In her most recent book, The Life and Death of Letitia King, A Critical Phenomenology of Transphobia, Solomon uses a critical phenomenological approach to analyze the murder of Letitia King based on her own courtroom observations. Solomon is, cur is currently at work um, on two projects, a manuscript on imagination, experiment, and ethics in mid-century phenomenology, and a monograph exploring narratives, narrations of bodily pain and disability in contemporary memoir, entitled Painography, Metaphor, and the Phenomenology of Chronic Pain. On today's panel, Solomon will respond to Paul's talk, situating it in relation to both reading and matter. As Solomon demonstrates in her critical phenomenolo phenomenological reading of the murder of Letitia King, doing so entails, quote, readings of absence as well as presence, imaginings that try to animate what is occluded and its relationship to what is manifest. In Solomon's own reading, not of the homophobia, but of the transphobia in the misrepresentation of Letitia King as a gay boy rather than a trans girl, in court as well as in the concurrent media coverage and critical reception of the case, she reveals the violent erasure of failing to represent trans bodies as such and the corresponding denial of the specificities of queer embodiment. Both through the example of her own reading practices and in her response to Paul's talk, Solomon will address how this queer phenomenological reading of Kleist enacts the ways in which reading matters. Please join me in welcoming Katrin Paul and Gail Solomon. Thank you, Mari, for the very nice introduction, and thank you, uh, Daniela, Zuleika, and Mari, uh, for organizing the conference, but also for uh, doing so, so thoughtfully. Um, and thinking about the pairings, thinking about 
even suggesting topics to us. Um, and, um, and thinking about alternative formats for these panels too. All right, this is going to be somewhat traditional though. No PowerPoint either. Um, I will take the second word in the title of this conference, mostly in the verbal sense, giving an example for why or how reading, and by that I mean close reading, may matter. My object or my interlocutor today is a literary text. The comedy and analytic courtroom play the Broken Jug, that's Zerbrochene Krug, which was written in the early 19th century by the Prussian author Heinrich von Kleist. I will read The Broken Jug as a play with multiple climaxes. This means that orgasms traverse, via the title character of the jug, the play's human protagonists, the peasant girl Eve, her fiancé Ruprecht, and the village judge Adam. It also means that the play is mackled. The multiplicity of its dramatic climaxes stems from Kleist improperly overlaying several different dramas, and that, that's what I call mackle. Um, while developing this reading, I will certainly also attend to the mater materiality of language, the physical conditions of staging a plurivalent text, the material effects it has, as well as, although to a lesser degree, the matters of the world that this te text creates. So the first section is called Undisentangled. Thank you, Mari, for bringing that up. Um, the Broken Jug had its premiere in Goethe's theater in Weimar in 1808 and was published in 1811. Kleist's comedy is a messy play about mess that leaves things undisentangled, as I prefer to translate the word unentworfen, which Kleist puts in the mouth of one of his characters. We already heard this. Suppose the matter here, as I'm afraid it may, remains undisentangled. On the diegetic level, we find a jug in shambles, a nighttime ruckus in Eve's room, a disheveled village judge by the name Adam, dubious bookkeeping, sausage in the files, a nest of cats in a wig, supposedly, a flooding creek, incontinence, bad smells, and so on and so forth. On the level of the play's structure, such undisentanglement involves the mutual interference of at least two dramas. It involves improvisation, paradoxically shaping a literary piece of theater, incompatible intertextual references, incoherent tempo, and a text that claims to be both complete and constitutively supplementary. And I'll talk about what that means. The action of this analytic play largely consists in determining who violated Eve's private sphere and broke the jug in her room. It takes place as a court trial with Eve's mother, Martha Rall, a plaintiff, I'm oh, sorry, Martha Rall, Martha Rall, a pla as plaintiff and Ruprecht Tümpel, Eve's fiancé, as defendant. The play also features the meta-legal action that um, as the village judge Adam hears the case, he's being inspected by the assessor Walter from the high court in Utrecht and regarded with suspicion by his own clerk, Licht. This meta action gets entangled with the primary action as it quickly becomes obvious that Adam was involved in the breaking of the drug. We also hear in the variant that he abuses his power trying to get closer to Eve by offering her a doctor's certificate to get Ruprecht out of military service in the East Indian colonies. Um, the jumbled stories Judge Adam makes up on the fly both encumber and advance the analysis of the case as well as the development of the play. Misunderstandings often prove more productive than orderly ratiocination, reasoning. The buildup and denouement of the dramatic arc follow the same jumping temporality as the court proceedings, which are sometimes hopelessly stalled before hastily speeding up again. The dramatic text presents a recalcitrant and unperformable mess 
in that Kleist publishes an abbreviated version together with an appendant variant. So it's a variant I talked about or mentioned earlier. Um, so that's why, it, why it's both complete and also sort of constitutively supplemented. The extended version offers more or less the text that flopped in Goethe's production. The short version is more truncated than abbreviated and cannot quite stand on its own. As if to show that cutting is a crime and in any case impossible, the abbreviated version features remarks that make no sense without knowledge of the variant. And it scandalously reduces Eve's account of the, the events to nothing but a sen one sentence. The variant contains Eve's extended statement plus an exchange between her and Walter, which Eve's accounts, uh, while Eve's account seems to offer the resolution of the plot, Walter's intervention at the end raises new questions and substantially alters the meaning of the play. We get the impression that the assessor Walter is also deceiving Eve and that there is thus no higher authority of justice to appeal to when one runs into problems with a lower one. But this impression remains as inconclusive as the structure of the play. The final scene in both versions sets the stage for the absent sequel when it has the plaintiff, Mar Martha Rall, asking for directions to the higher court. The reader closes the book without a clear picture of what happened and the spectator leaves the theater amused but puzzled and vaguely alarmed. Now, it has to be said that this undisentangled quality of the broken jug has commonly not been embraced. While it is one of his most popular plays, it has often, perhaps even predominantly, been staged, translated, and even published in German in the truncated, uh, even published in German in the truncated version, without the so-called variant. In fact, only one English translation includes the variant. And that's John Swan's translation in a volume of Kleist plays edited by Walter Hindra. And the, the, his title is actually The Broken Picture. So I'm sorry about that, but I really like Broken Jug better. So if you want to read the play, read The Broken Picture. As a result of such decisive simplifying or straightening out of the textual material, the play is almost universally read as an amusing instance of an apparently trivial abuse of power a case of boys will be boys, or here perhaps, perhaps rather, old men will be lechers, meaning that it is clear to everybody that Adam sexually assaulted Eve. And I will disabuse you of such clarity. Okay, the next section is called, there is a double to every kind of trouble, and that's also a quote from the play. As already indicated, it is immediately obvious that the broken jug superimposes at least two dramas, an analytic courtroom play with a meta-legal action. In the, first, in the first, Eve's reputation is at stake. In the other, Adam's. These two human protagonists effectively, effectively displace the artifactual title character, the jug. Previous scholarship has shown that this comedy does not exactly leave us with all problems solved. The question of truth remains deeply troubled through the ending, including the issue of who is to be believed. One of the most comedic aspects of the play are the jumbled stories that Adam seems to make up on the fly as if to cement his innocence. Adam follows the procedure that Kleist himself advocates for in his essay on the, titled On the Gradual Fabrication of Thoughts While Speaking. But he is not very, Adam is not very successful and seems to get all tangled up in the net of his iridescent stories. The theater audience generally takes this to mean that Adam has lost his dignity from the beginning. From the outset, they pass judgment on Adam's stories. It's the fact that as spectators or readers, we tend to side with Licht, and, and that means light, um, uh, with Licht, the, the clerk, and look at Adam with suspicion, a question of truth or a question of taste. Kleist seems to position his audience on the side of the Enlightenment, 
unable or unwilling to share Adam's predilection for extravagance. But some of the most outlandish details of Adam's stories are corroborated by other witness accounts. This doesn't give many readers pause, which only underscores the aforementioned difficulty Adam has with receiving recognition. So we might begin to wonder whether we weren't at fault not to trust him. This is not only a question of justice, but also of taste, and not only an issue with truth, but also with poetics. Giving the benefit of the doubt overlaps here with suspending disbelief. And as this suspension draws us further into the modern realm of literature, our distrust of Adam's person or ethos is fueled by modernity's suspicion of rhetoric. Adam certainly has a way with words, and it is just as certain that, this, that his way is ludicrous at times. When his discourse pirouettes, it shows off the fact that it wants to convince us. It flashes its rhetoricity. Adam's brilliant, brilliantly ready wit and flamboyance might make some suspicious, yet that, that something glitters doesn't mean that it is not gold. If we take Adam at his words, especially those that seem superfluous, excessive, or rhetorical, we will often realize that he does speak the truth. So we might want to push this method of taking Adam at his words and trusting in their sense to come beyond the puzzle of the whodunit, especially since the structure of the play strongly indicates that retrospective forensic etiology is not its only and perhaps not even its main point. The variant shows that the mystery has a life of its own or that, puz or that puzzling proves so enjoyable that one might want to continue after the issue has been solved. Be this as it may, I will take Adam at his word when he says, quote, yes, yes, there's a double to every kind of trouble, end quote, and assume that the statement is not exhausted in its initial enactment, yes, yes. Hence, I will argue that Eve is not the only casualty of this play. But first to the trouble that Adam's expression gives before it informs us of its double occurrence. Yes, in all its brevity, covers a rich array of meanings, especially when it is repeated. Eve says yes to Ruprecht, and there's no re reason to doubt that the singularly serious weight of her response to his marriage, to doubt the singularly serious weight of her response to his marriage proposal. But I will focus here on affirmations that call for reiteration on yes as an articulation of consent to sexual intercourse, as an expression of pleasure, as an incitement, indeed as a cry of orgasm. While many conventional plays build an arc of suspense that consistently leads to the climax, Kleist insistently uses a second stationary drama to resist, interrupt, break apart this arc and thus to perpetuate both the increase and the decrease of excitement, both the intensification and the dispersion of satisfaction. All of Kleist's plays are dramas of sexuality in this sense. They enact this particular kind of libidinal economy. I will read the shattering of the jug in the broken jug as orgasm. That is to say, I will read it, if not quite non-figuratively, unbildlich, it's also a quote from the play, then certainly metaleptically <coughs> as a poor metaphor, an example of bad taste. As such, the figure does not stand in for the, for the orgasm, but the orgasm takes place in or as speech about the shattering jug. And the speech shatters the figurativeness of the jug. The broken jug is a play with multiple orgasms. In line with the genre conventions for analytic drama, the broken jug pretends to begin after the climax. The morning after, we receive at least two narrative accounts of the orgasm, one from Ruprecht and then the authoritative 
um, though structurally marginalized one from Eve in the variant. The fact that they both can give di direct reports shows that Ruprecht and Eve are the primary participants in the sex act. But Adam also plays his role. We will later take a look at his more in indirect account. In our analysis of the three reports, we will move in the opposite direction from the plot development. We'll begin with Eve's report in the variant, which Kleist published as an addendum to his abbreviated version of the play, and then move backward to Ruprecht's account before finally analyzing Adam's version of his own orgasm, which he gives in the play's first scene. <clears throat> so here's Eve's account. Eve. That one falls, this one jumps, and Ruprecht crashes through the door, and I fall fainting back upon the bed. Gold green, like flame, swims all about me, and I stagger, leaning on the bed. Then that one falls, crashing backward from the window. I bend over him and hold him in my arms and say, Ruprecht, dear man. And so, um, in the moment of climax, everything around her simultaneously falls, jumps, and crashes. In her state of heightened sensitivity, she feels many things. Not just Ruprecht who bursts in, there's no sequence um, to her feeling, no cause and effect. Everything happens simultaneously in one line. Um, three articulated spasms, one eruption. That one falls, this one jumps, and Ruprecht crashes through the door. That's one line. While the other participants, that one and this one, remain rather undetermined, since in German it's springt. Springt can mean jumps or cracks, and um, she might be saying that Adam falls and the jug cracks, or that the jug falls and Adam jumps. Even in the end, um, Eve, in the end, clearly identifies, so the other, the other um, participants remain rather undetermined, Eve, in the end, clearly identifies the scene as one of intimacy between her and Ruprecht. After the climax, she wraps her arms around Ruprecht, gathers the entire scene in his name, and, ex and expresses her love. Yet Adam, in her account, provides the foreplay. So I quote Eve again, and that's before. You... He says, be wise, so he is Adam. You, he says, be wise, and opens the window. And Adam is in, in her room at this point. Um, you, he says, be wise, and, and opens the window, and steps on the footstool, and on the chair, and mounts the windowsill, and examines to see if he can leap, and turns and reaches toward the shelf where he had hung his wig, which he had forgot." End quote. Busy with a smaller orifice of Eve's room, not the door which Ruprecht will pierce, old Adam is more careful and deliberate than the tempestuous Ruprecht for whom this is, for all we know, the first time. Eve distinctly senses every lingering move Adam makes and steps on the footstool and on the chair and mounts the windowsill and examines. The grammar of her report makes frequent use of the conjunction and, and, as if to add one layer of sensation to the next without subordinating them to an intended outcome. When Adam turns around and bends over to attend to something he passed over the first time, this fault accelerates her account, adds fervor, and then things come to a head very quickly, quote, and grabs and pulls it from the jug, so the wig, and grabs and pulls it from the jug and pulls from off its shelf the jug as well. That one falls, this one jumps, and Ruprecht crashes through the door. Ruprecht is driven into Eve's cha chamber by his rage on noticing another man with her. In some tension with Eve's complaint about his inability to put absolute faith in her, his lack of trust actually contributes to their union, if perhaps not their love. This becomes clearer when we turn it to Ruprecht's account, which I will do now. Urged on and supplemented by the questions and commentaries of the judge and the assessor, Ruprecht's narrative only very slowly unravels the events of the previous night. 
In this way, he catches up with a moment that was too sudden and too explosive for him to be alive to it at, to be alive to it at the time. Ruprecht gives his entire account of the event, including the hour or so leading up to it, in the historical present tense. But he counteracts the immediacy of the present tense with his painstaking use of the inquit formula, so he says, I say, and so forth, which greatly irritates his impatient erogators. When he finally arrives at the description of the climax, he initiates it with a now that launches him into a quasi-reenactment of the moment. Now pulls us right in and has us ga gasping for air together with Ruprecht. The onslaught of presence is so overwhelming that even this retroactive report has to disperse excitement by repeating the now three times and the call for air twice. Quote Ruprecht, now it wells, your honor, Adam. It wells up in me like a burst of blood. Air, off pops a button from my chest. Air now, I rip my collar open. Air now, I say, and run and shove and kick and batter. The inquit in air now, I say, cannot provide much slowdown. The exclamation mark positions behi positioned behind it marks it as part of Ruprecht's direct speech. With the I say being part of his exclamation, Ruprecht adds emphasis to his order for air. He makes a fool of himself, showing a lack of judgment on who or what can be ordered around. The air will certainly not heed even his repeated requests. On a more serious note, his desperate command reminds us of, the two, of two of the major themes of this play, the limits of human control and the limits of communication. We note the tremor between two temporalities in Ruprecht's account. On the one hand, the forward thrust of desire, which Ruprecht shares with the court authorities, Adam and Walter. Walter. On the other, the retardations and digressions intercalated to enjoy the moment again and again, which makes him sound dumb. Ruprecht has experienced, even acted on behalf of, the cruelty of the libidinal, libidinal economy that explodes all excitement. Now he retrospectively and discursively, one could even say aesthetically, struggles to find a different economy, a different way to gauge the death drive. His delays and forms of indirectness are a procedure. Quote, Ruprecht and run and shove and kick and batter because I find the slut's door locked. Stand back a step, then boot the door once more, hard and in. Adam, I blaze this boy. Ruprecht, now as it bangs wide open, the jug topples from its shelf there into the room, and whoosh out the window, this figure leaps. I see those coattails flapping, even now. Adam's manileptic interference, I blaze this boy, is rather interesting. He interjects into Rup Rup Ruprecht's report, surprisingly siding with him, because he hasn't sided with him before at all. Um, it is hard to decide whether Adam is being ironic, so far he has shown only derision for Ruprecht, or proud of Ruprecht's viril virility in an identificatory, oh, sorry, or proud of Ruprecht's vir virility in an identificatory way, which would preserve a certain distance between the events and their narration, or whether he is aroused by Ruprecht's sudden entry, which would transfer him into the narrated scene and thus constitute a metalepsis. In any case, the narrative mode of Ruprecht's version of the climax metaleptically coincides with the picture it paints and with the phrase it, uh, this, with the phrase illustrated by this picture. Ruprecht fällt mit der Tür ins Haus. So the phrase means coming straight to the point or blurting some, something out, but literally it means falling with the door into the house. So Ruprecht falls with the door into Eve's chamber. In his narrative, as in his sexual behavior, Ruprecht proves clumsy, verging on violent. 
Compared with Eve's account, Rupert's ex experience is less layered and more fleeting. And whoosh! Accordingly, it shows less simultaneity of events and sensations. Instead, the narrative mode suggests a subordination of the tightly linked events along the line of cause and effect. Now, as it bangs wide, this quote, now as it bangs wide open, that jug topples from its shelf there. End quote. As if the air pressure from the thrust of the door swept the jug from the sill on the other side of the room, except that the jug falls in the opposite direction into the room. But that's also definitely procedure in Kleist. I can talk about that. As the jug falls into the room, Ruprecht's eyes are drawn in the direction of his own momentum out the window, where the flaps of an outer garment stir his attention. Quote, I see those co coat tails flapping even now. Clearly, Ruprecht drops his interest in Eve. He declares, quote, I throw her over. In German, die werf ich über den Haufen and means it both literally, that he knocks her over, and metaphorically, that he drops the idea of marrying her. Her room, is only, her room is only a transit space, in one side and out the other, to get to the guy. Quote, rushing to the window, I find him. Eve stands between men, between old Adam and Knecht Ruprecht, one as devilish as the other. Or rather, between them, she collapses into something formless, a haufen, a heap or pile. Ruprecht, who comically still has in his hand part of the door with which he fell into the room, now uses that piece, the handle, which, quote, a pound weight, functions as a fant fantastically hefty version of a penis, to beat what, so he uses that piece, to beat what we can assume is Adam's bald head. Qu quote Ruprecht, the handle, it's in my hand from when I battered the door, so now I bring it down, a pound weight, and, th and thump his knob. After a brief tussle with the guy in the dark, Ruprecht experiences his own, his version of orgasmic simultaneity. Quote, Ruprecht, and him, and night, and walled, and windowsill I'm standing on, everything collapses into a sack. The metaphor of the sack is a curious one. It alludes to the folklore figure Knecht Ruprecht, who carries a sack whose purpose, to contain badly behaved children, is only superficially masked by the sweets he produces out of it. The image of orgasmic release here thus conjures up several destructive aspects of the drive. Loss of world, self-punishment, pun I'm going to do Karen's thing, self-punishment, mm -hmm. and a general cruelty to children. Eve and Ruprecht are the children of the play, and they certainly encounter no shortage of verbal abuse from their parents and from the officials of the paternalistic state. Ruprecht's orgasm is powerful, quote, as if a storm had swept me off a cliff 10 fathoms high, I fall and think I'll go right through the floor. When the attack is over, it is as if it all had been a dream, quote, and I sit up and rub my eyes. Ruprecht was supposedly heading toward certain death in East India. Now he whom Eve will have brought into close proximity to Jesus is resurrected. Quote, as I know, rise from the dead. Auf, aufersteh. Okay. Before I analyze Adam's account of the nighttime climax, let me briefly point to a different scene of intimacy, the one between Adam and Walter. The tenth scene, so Ruprecht's account was in the seventh scene, the tenth scene gives the court proceedings and the legal action a break. The scribe, Licht, leaves to fetch a new witness, and the court takes a recess until his return. Judge Adam asks the village people to take their break outside, he attempts to get rid of the intra-diegetic spectators for a private tete-a-tete -tete with Walter. 
Kleist models the difference between the two stages, the court and the theater, when he has Adam use the vocabulary of stage directions, exit people, and, and of theater architecture, exit to the foyer. This, in turn, troubles the difference between the spectators on stage and the audience of the floor, who could be asked here to take a break in the foyer of the theater. And I, was, I actually you know, attended a production, production where we were asked to go outside while that scene was played on stage. In a sense, the break in the legal action also serves as a break in the performance. The scene between Adam and Walter falls somewhat outside the performance proper and can appear like a casual encounter not exactly meant for public consumption. During this somewhat private break, some decisive information emerges, decisive both for the legal proceedings and for the interpretation of the play. Nevertheless, this information tends to remain largely without effect. It fails to decide anything or divide anyone. During the break, as parts of the audience might stroll the foyer, Walter discovers Adam's queer feelings. And I'm not going to offer you the analysis right now for reasons of time. Um, Walter's recognition of Adam's gay preferences, albeit impossible to prove, proof, given that it is based in illusions, makes the desire for Eve, which most readers impute to the old Adam, a bit unlikely. If we nevertheless continue to assume this desire in Adam, we participate in a disciplinary technology, the theater, that reproduces as normative the same desires. It ostensibly penalizes on the level of the content, the trial. The plot leads us, to the uh, leads us to assume that the whole purpose of the legal and dramatic process lies in the expulsion and physical punishment, which will be eventually meted out um, here in the comical form of whippings by his own wig, of the dirty old man who uses his status to get the maiden against her will. I argue that underneath this layer of the play lies the drama of the drama of old Adam, who doesn't fit the new gender norms. And new, I mean in the sense that they have been historically introduced around Kleist's time. Um, and who doesn't fit the heterosexual compulsion they bring. And who is being prosecuted in a circuitous way, since one cannot address any of this directly and explicitly, uh, being scapegoated and driven out of town in order to secure and hasten the heterosexual marriage. I don't dispute that the play suggests that Adam sexually harassed Eve. Instead, I argue that Kleist overlays one case with another. As the judge says, we've got two cases here. Adam proves doubly suspicious, both for and of. That was a quote. Um, both as a lecherous old straight man and in his unspeakable effeminacy, desiring unspeakable effeminacy, desiring who knows what. Adam falls or fails twice, when he wants another man's bride and when he doesn't. The audience, as a history of the reception of the broken jerk shows, generally prefers the first fall. But the double text also sustains and requires acknowledgement of the second. The incongruity between the, these two overlapping falls, two overlapping cases, two overlapping dramas, two overlapping audience expectations, and two overlapping affective valences needs to be acknowledged as ev evidence for the fundamentally queer character of Kleist's theater. So how do we acknowledge Adam's experience, his predicament, his want? Despite what I just pointed out, um, no, despite what I just pointed to about his participation in gay culture, um, Adam is clearly interested in the physical presence of Eve. As he's chased out of her chamber, he urges her to visit him the next day. 
But what exactly he wants from her, we are not told. We learn that once in her room, he takes her hands, so that's before he's chased out, he takes her hands and fixes his gaze on her for two full minutes. Quote, Eve, he grabs me so with both hands, so, and looks at me. Miss, Mrs. Martha, and looks, Ruprecht, and looks at you. Eve, two endless minutes star staring at my face, Miss Martha, and says, Ruprecht says nothing. Eve, you vile wretch, I say, when he does speak. What do you take me for? And push him back so that he, he tumbles over. In the garden, he had, end quote, in the garden, he had assured Eve that what he wants will take only two minutes. So presumably, he got his satisfaction. It appears that he says something to Eve after the two minutes, but we, the two minutes of staring at her, but we only hear her indignant reaction. The ellipsis in Eve's account not only serves as a sign of her modesty, but also perpetuates the cruelty of withholding recognition. Nobody has words for Adam's desire. The whole in Eve's account also serves Kleist as he plays with his audience. Omissions of this sort uh, form an integral part of his strategy to force the audience to participate in the action via the drama of interpretation. As Eve pushes Adam away, we begin to fill in the blanks of the play to produce a proper illusion or a beautiful appearance, German schöner Schein. In the absence of concrete evidence or reliable information, heterosexual stereotypes fill the void. They flesh out what Adam might have put in the empty space of the certificate, the shine. Quote, this is, I mean, he asked her to come back to get the certificate that's supposedly going to free Ruprecht or excuse Ruprecht from military service. So, in a uh, quote, Adam, in, and in the middle, I have left a space, in the middle of the certificate or the shine, in, in the middle, I have left a space just as big as a puddle, or Tümpel in German, which is also the last name of Ruprecht. This I fill in now. End quote. But this means that we, we, we are forced to fill in the space, means that it will have been our dirty Im imagination that brings to light the crime from out of the muddy, forgiving and infectious waters of the puddle. Here, Kleist's mockery of the Enlightenment is subtle but unmistakable. Whether it is our dirty imagination or whether our imagination is not dirty or not deviant enough, we become complicit in the sexualized violence that is committed against Eve and against Adam. The court setting makes us all want to invade Eve's private sphere, even as the, so makes us all want to invade Eve's private sphere, meaning we want to hear what happened in, 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 in her room. Um, even as the lack or empty space or hole that draws our desire to know might rather be in Adam's court. Kleist turns us all into lecherous Adams who want to get into Eve's chamber and know her secret. For the spectator, it can't go fast enough as the fact that Kleist had to cut the play shows. Kleistian violence does not spare the audience members who in turn scapegoat Adam for their own violence. Adam gets punished for the audience's haste and the lecherous fantasies that Kleist almost forces on them. In addition to Adam penetrating and, according to the historically new sex gender system, completing Eve, Adam and Eve, and Adam usurping Ruprecht's place in the marriage certificate, another shine, we can read, quote, this place I fill now as Adam filling in for Eve. Shine, then, in addition to document or certificate, and in addition to theatrical illusion or semblance, comes to mean gender performance or drag. 
in the widest sense of the term. Adam, I suggest, wants to play the role Eve gets to play. He wants to take her place in a bit of transgender self-expression. Expression. When Eve <clears throat> reports, quote, I introduced him into my sh chamber, or to my chamber, this can then be read as Eve teaching Adam the practices and secrets of feminine masquerade or feminine gender performance. In this case, it makes sense that Adam looks at her for two full minutes without saying or doing anything. He's not impatient to take her, rather he needs time to study her so as to better imitate her. Nothing in the text prevents us from imagining that he t stares at her not because he wants to have her, but because he wants to be her. Eve is not amused. Adam's performance doesn't fly. She responds with disgust and abuse. You vile wretch, I say, and push him back so that he tumbles over. And Ruprecht bangs at the door. Adam feels, quote, betrayed and quickly recovers the appearance of heterosexual gender conform conformity. Um, quote, resorting to semblance, den Schein ergreifend, which he had cast off in the form of his wig a few minutes before. Eve remains so horrified by the revelation and apparently so traumatized by, the somehow, by somehow having become associated with it that she would rather suffer ac accusations of promiscuity than speak about Adam's transgender inclination. When Eve reports, quote, then that one dear falls crashing backward from the window, I think in this life he, er, he'll not rise, rise again. The sentence suggests a causal link between um, Ruprecht, so she's talking about Ruprecht apparently here, Ruprecht's fall and his inability to get up again. But the phrase is also remain disjointed, and not only syntactically so, since the use of slightly different pronouns, der and er, leaves uncertain whether they refer to the same person, especially as a few lines earlier, um, these pronouns were used to distinguish between reference, even though it could not be conclusively determined which one refers to the jug and which one refers to Adam. The blurriness of the picture as to who is the subject of the fall and the impossible resurrection results from the superimposition of at least two death wishes. Eve wishes Ruprecht dead, possibly as a punishment for his pending departure, and Adam dead, possibly as a punishment for his gender performance, and perhaps she wishes her virginity, the jug, broken. She gets her wishes and is able to resolve all these conflicting tendencies in the apotheosis of Ruprecht. She emits a cry and cracks, springt, and leaps, springt, into a tableau vivant of the Pietà in which she, play, she plays the role of the soaring mother of God and Ruprecht serves as the crucified. Quote, I cry, so that's the crack, I cry, O savior of the world, and jump, spring, bend over him and hold him in my arms and say, Ruprecht, dear man, lieber Mensch. She can thus be sure of Ruprecht's re resurrection and gets to enjoy the crack while also fitting perfectly into the new gender norm of affectionate and suffering mother. Every illicit pleasure can be retained in this glorifying aufhebung of the properly heterosexual couple, except for Adams. He has dropped out of the picture. So let's now finally, this will be brief, look at Adam's account of the nocturnal climax. It is offered in the play's opening scene. As part of an exchange between Adam and Licht, who, who Licht wants to know how Adam got the wounds to his head. Quote, Adam, battle? What? With that blasted goat buck jutting from the stove I strove to battle, if you would have it so. It comes back to me now. I lose balance, yes, and at the t same time reach out, arms flailing like a drowning man, clutch at my trousers, which last night I'd hung all wet to dry upon the rack. 
Now I clutch hold of them, you see, believing like a fool that they will hold me up. And now rip my waistband tears. Waistband now and trousers and me, all three, we fall. And there, smack on the corner of that stove with the goat box, where the goat box sticks out his nose, I come hurtling head first down. Like the other two we analyzed, this account establishes an overwhelming presence, here achieved by the adverb now, which marks uh, sometimes noon, sometimes yet, yes, uh, jetzt, sorry, noon, jetzt in German. So the adverb now, which marks and quickens the beat, even against the slowing effect of the repetition of a clutch and the unnecessary explanation you see, believing like a fool that they will hold me up. The extraneous phrases, as well as the possibly elongated pronunciation of now in some instances, particularly when the German features noon instead of jetzt, suggests that Adam uses the practice recommended in the essay on the fa gradual fabrication of thoughts while, thoughts while speaking and plays for time until the crucial idea arrives. But since the point of his story has been clear from the beginning, he fell, the playing for time can only concern the particulars of this twist of the ever-insisting drive. And so the account performs what it conveys, a delicious delay right before the climax. Again, the incident comprises the orga or the orgi or or orgiastic, orgiastic coincidence of three falls, Waistba waistband, now, and trousers, and me, all three, we fall. The ménage à trois with the pants and the waistband mirrors his threesome with Eve and Ruprecht. But these are not exactly three separate things, let alone persons. As a piece of clothing, the trousers are part of Adam's appearance and the waistband is part of the trousers. The account exuberantly or painfully produces a threesome, threesome out of a rather lonely affair. Whether it comes to tripping or getting off, Adam does it by himself. He, quote, bears within himself his own stumbling block for impulse, Stein zum Anstoß. In what seems more masturbation than sexual encounter, Adam makes do with props because his de desire is either unintelligible or unacceptable to other people. Like the waistband and the trousers, Eve and Ruprecht can't give Adam the required support. They don't see him and can't tell what he wants. <coughs> His only witness is the nosy goat bug who cranes toward him from the edge of the oven. Or else they take offense, nehmen Anstoß, like Eve when he eventually tells her what he wants. But then the bone of contention, Stein des Anstoßes, renders her mute as a block or as a goat-shaped ornament on the oven. Adam insists that his, his orgasmic fall took place in the morning. Quote, now, the instant I climb out of bed. If we take him seriously, and I think that we need to, because we have no criterion to decide which parts of his story are made up on the spot and which are true, this indicates that the somewhat botched intercourse at night radiates into the morning. The next day, Adam is still drunk or in dire need, like a drowning man. During the night in question, he seems to have enjoyed somewhat of a release when he emptied his bowels on the way home. This incident leaves its mark, as it were, on his account of the next morning. We can assume that his pants had been wet and needed to be hung on the oven because of the runs the night before even though, or indeed because, Adam receives no recognition for his desire, he enjoys three climaxes, the leap through his window, the explosive bowel movement, and the masturbation the morning after. The drive pulsates through Adam. To conclude, let us return to the drama of interpretation. The audience participation in injustice takes not only the forms of a dirty imagination, and thus possibly unfounded accusations, 
or of the enlightenment compulsion to bring things to light and thereby not only uncover but also ironically produce secrets, it also takes the form of ignorance and lack of understanding. As Adam's gay desire and transgender needs are being ignored and suppressed, he's nevertheless subterraneously despised and ostracized for them. The entire play builds up to presenting Adam as the devil. Quote, I think it's Walter uh, towards the end. Quote, you mean you think the devil lives here in this courthouse? Kleist's comedy not only illustrates the dangers of a politics intent on disidentifying with the villain, it also underscores once again that preconceived notions inform our ways of reading matter while urging us to read matter differently. First, I'd like to echo some of the thanks that have already been offered um, to Eduardo for truly heroic administrative wrangling, uh, uh, and to Mari Daniela and Zuleika for organizing uh, this conference. I've been in awe of uh, and inspired by your uh, intellectual energy, uh, your logistical chops, uh, and your ability to make this all happen. So thanks for bringing us all together. Uh, thanks also to Katrine for her, for her intricate uh, and provocative readings of uh, this play. As Mari noted, in her reading of Kleist's uh, The Broken Jug, Katrine translates the German word unentworen as undisentangled a delightfully layered word describing intertwined layeredness. Undisentangled gives us the tangle and also the possibility of its release, though that possibility is held in abeyance by that prefatory un. The broken jug introduces us to Eve, bearing a name undisentanglable from feminine deception and sin, her hapless fiance Ruprecht, clumsy, verging on violent, Paul calls him, and Adam, the judge that readers are encouraged to judge. Most of the readers and commenters on this play have assumed that a sexual assault has taken place, that Adam raped Eve in her bedroom, and that she lies in court to protect her honor or his. Uh, indeed, before she alerted me to the proper translation, I read the common translation, and this was my assumption as well. But Paul aims to convince us otherwise and suggests that, in fact, no assault has taken place. The matter of convincing, of persuasion, is central to the play itself, from Adam's comic stammered denials to his more elaborately spun alibis. The effort to convince takes a number of forms, not all of them legal. Like most legal dramas, indeed, like many legal cases, what happens in sidebar, or what is whispered sotto voce, or is confessed outside the doors of the courtroom, is as material to the process as the law itself. Paul, in discussing Adam's attempts to convince the other characters, if never quite the readers, uh, of his innocence, points out that, quote, I'm quoting Katrine here, quote, when his discourse pirouettes it shows off the fact that it wants to convince us. It flashes its rhetoric rhetoricity, unquote. So what ought we make of these moments of flashed rhetoricity? And since we were both trained as rhetoricians, I think we're both irresistibly compelled by those moments of flashed rhetoricity. These moments when the very virtuosity and excess of language meant to convince can obscure the fact that such language might indeed contain the truth. Adam certainly does harass and demean Eve. There may be macking in all this mackling, 
but Paul insists that Kleist's extended version of the play uh, casts doubt on that common interpretation of sexual assault. She reads the scene in the extended version of the broken pitcher in which Adam, after entering Eve's room, grasps her with both hands and stares into her eyes for two minutes, after which she pushes him away and denounces him as vile. Hardly a scene of ravishment, this. If Paul is right, then Eve's lies under oath must be read differently, her protests perhaps seen as the remonstrations of a woman scorned. What then should the audience understand about what has transpired in that bedchamber? It's all a little hard to figure out. The play is both richly layered and, quote, a recalcitrant and unperformable mess, unquote, as Paul calls it. She suggests that the trouble here is doubled, that Adam's subject positioning is not what it might at first seem, and that the play offers a queer case hidden underneath a straight one, a straight play as a beard for a queer thing. Is Adam identified at the end of the play as the villain, not because he's been deceptive and dishonorable, but because of some more wayward desire. He is indeed named as a devil. According to Frau Marta, quote, whoever loves justice should seize a mighty club and quite wipe out this monster of the night, unquote. Is this the righteous mother avenging her wronged daughter or queer bashing? Paul illuminates something transgressive in Adam's comportment and reads his actions, particularly in that complicated bedchamber threesome, as containing, quote, a bit of transgender self-expression, unquote. If we are reading for drag, what better evidence than that wig and the inordinate number of lines the play spends describing, imagining, losing, searching for, chasing, finding, again losing, und so weiter, then finally brandishing it as a ready-to-hand flogger. Paul reads the rich array of meanings conveyed by yes in this text, and there are many yeses throughout. Some are expressions of consent to sex or to marriage, Rupert's report of Eve's response to his proposal of marriage, quote, this is Rupert, I asked her, will you? And she answered, oh, how you do cackle. Then later she said, <laughs> yes. In Rupert's recounting, that temporal span between the proposal and the acceptance exists as a strange pause, a blank, another example of an ellipsis to be read alongside that other hole in the account that Paul reads, that two endless minutes of Adam staring at Eve, which would seem to exonerate him of the charge of rape. We can also read a parade of no's throughout the play. What is the structure and function of the no as it emerges from the mouths of these characters? Frau Marta commands her daughter to speak the truth of what happened in that bedchamber, and Adam responds no to stop her from speaking. Indeed, much of the action of the play is delay, redirection, and interruption engineered to keep Eve from speaking. Eve is asked if it was Rupert that broke that jug, and she responds, no. Several scenes later, she affirms that, yes, it was Adam who broke the jug. Was Eve then ravished by Adam, the wigless scoundrel, the monster? Or was Eve, in fact, the wicked one, the slut, the whore, the hussy, the low-down wench, for the play gives her all these names, who concocted a story and cast blame on both Rupert and Adam to hide her own shamelessness? At some level, as Paul's paper makes clear, it hardly matters. If it is, in the end, Eve who is to blame, it would be because she didn't say no when she should have. She offers many no's, but not when it counts. I would suggest that we can read the rich array of meanings of the nine as well as the ya. I would claim further that reading the array of meanings contained in a no has long been the primary task when sexual assault is at issue. Parsing the meanings of yeses and noes is a central hermeneutic strategy in both the perpetuation of and the resistance to cultures of exoneration around sexual assault. Consider rape trials, which often take as their central concern whether or not the survivor uttered the word no, how loudly and how many times, 
a speech act that is required in order to move her from the category of participant in a sexual act to the victim of a crime. Within a legal framework, the absence of a no often means a yes. To which the feminist response was the adage no means no, a tautology that only becomes sensical in the context of a misogynist framing, both legal and extra legal, that yes and no can both mean yes. Paul makes the case persuasively that things may be more undecidable than they seem in this play, that the ellipses leave enough room for both activity and identity to be in doubt and enough room for a queer reading. But if these holes in the text, wide as puddles, says Kleist, open up the space for a queer reading of Adam, what then becomes of Eve? What do we do with that titular jug, which is, after all, still broken? whether by the shattering of orgasm or some less pleasurable means? And how are we positioned as readers of this play or the spectators to its staging? Is that two minute stare, even if it makes us reconsider Adam's character and his guilt, sufficient to pivot the play's comedy, which turns throughout on the serial violation of the bedchamber, the jug, and Eve herself? To frame the question more broadly, how should we understand the proximity of comedy and sexual assault here? What to make of the ways that laughter, sexual violence, and the question of who is to blame are, to use that word again, undisentangled? To consider this undisentanglement, I want to think about what may be the paradigmatic example of the marriage between comedy and sexual assault, the rape joke. The rape joke is a perfect crystallization of the intersection between comedy and sexual assault, performing the condensation that, according to Freud, characterizes all jokes. Here's a rape joke about rape jokes. Who wants to hear a rape joke? No? That's the spirit. <laughs> There's that condensation at work. Do you want to hear the joke? You do not hear, want to hear the joke. So you or I or we who do not want to hear the rape joke are analogized to the one who is raped, the one whose refusal of consent is what makes the sexual act rape. But we are already in the midst of it when the possibility of refusal emerges. The joke is structured like a rape because the refusal, no, comes as the joke is already in process. You may not want it, but that doesn't matter. It's already happening. The response of the addressee of the joke, we who are listening, is central to this joke. We who hear the joke are solicited by the teller, and our response is echoed by the one telling the joke. No, even though a response is not heard from the one to whom the joke is told. Because the joke cites and echoes a no from the listener that is never actually heard, the refusal cannot function as such. The no is assumed, it is repeated without being uttered the first time, a repetition that turns a withholding of consent to a report of that withholding. And in its repetition and echo, the no shifts from the imperative to the interrogative. The function of the question mark with which the teller punctuates and returns the no is not entirely clear. It may indicate assent or doubt. It may intend clarification or affirmation. The joke's humor and its discomfort resides in its holding the no in abeyance. Holding the no in abeyance can also be done by turning it into a yes, as in this rape joke about rape jokes. Do you find rape jokes funny? Never, never mind, I know you mean yes. In this joke, the unheard no is discarded altogether, revised into its opposite. In each joke, it is the presence of the no that is not heard that marks the joke as a rape joke. In jokes and their relation to the unconscious, Freud calls the hearer of the joke the assailed. The assailed inhabits the proper spirit of the rape joke by offering resistance, by offering a no. Never mind turns that no into a yes, which turns the assailant from one who is fixated on the no, eroticizing the resistance of the assailant to one who is merely acting as if that no were not there. Sorry, eroticizing the resistance of the assailed. To the one who is merely acting as if that no is not there. As if any no must really mean yes. The structure of the joke achieves its effect 
through its action on the structure of the no, multiplying its meanings while at the same time ensuring that no matter what meaning emerges, the assailant is the victor. The assailant, either the joke teller or the rapist, can hear either a no or a yes from the assailed, and the character of either the rape or the joke is unaltered either way. Rape jokes fall into the category of what Freud calls ten tendentious jokes. Some, but not all, rape jokes are smutty jokes, and smutty jokes, according to Freud, are jokes that are characterized by aggression, an aggression that is specifically sexual. Quoting Freud here from Jokes on the Relation to the Unconscious, quote, a person who laughs at smut that he hears is laughing as though he were a spectator of an act of sexual aggression. Smut is like an exposure of the sexually different person to whom it is directed. By the utterance of the obscene word, it compels the person who is assailed to imagine the part of the body or the procedure in question and shows her that the assailant is himself imagining it. Close quote. For Freud, the smutty joke is an assault. And it is important that the listener is female. He emphasizes that the joke, assumed to be told by a man, requires sexual difference, or at least the sexually different, in order to complete its circuit. But it is also just as significantly a staging of a response to an assault. On Freud's telling of the telling, the hearer is assaulted with the image of the assailant or joke teller imagining a body part or procedure. In the rape joke, the assailed is confronted with the assailant imagining rape. Just as the rape joke recruits the hearer regardless of her willingness, the broken jug makes an accomplice of the audience. Paul notes that Kleist's drama and its ellipses stage a blank where the audience is forced to participate in the action, required to imagine the scene in, bed, in the bedchamber and the breaking of the jug. As an audience, we become complicit in the sexualized violence through our desire to see what the staging withholds. When we cannot see it, our impulse is to imagine what we cannot see. For the audience, no form of refusal is possible. In contemporary culture, examples of the proximity of rape to joke abound. The media eruption around accusations of rape against Bill Cosby was launched by a joke in comedian Hannibal Burris's stand-up routine. Bill Cosby, in turn, first responded to the allegations of rape by many women by calling them a joke, dismissing them as not to be taken seriously. There's also been extensive feminist response to the pervasiveness of rape jokes. Indeed, one comedian has suggested that we are living in the golden age of rape jokes. So I've slid here from the golden age of German literature to the golden age of rape jokes, something of an undignified uh, <clears throat> slide. Uh, Hannah Gadsby's stand-up special, Nanette, offers an extended meditation on the cultural inseparability of rape and joke, and a metatextual critique on comedy's reliance on sexual assault. In its review, the New York Times called Nanette comedy destroying and soul affirming. But is there any other way to read a rape joke? Is it possible for rape jokes to work otherwise? Can a rape joke be funny? Can it be feminist? Can it be both of these things at the same time? Or is that soul affirmation incompossible with comedic form? Does the conflation of feminism with humorlessness make that impossible? How many feminists does it take to change a light bulb? That's not funny. What then distinguishes the rape joke as misogynist from the rape joke that is feminist or that offers critique? Consider another example of a rape joke about rape jokes. If you don't want to hear a rape joke, maybe you shouldn't have dressed like you want to hear a rape joke. This is another joke that turns on the analogy of rape to joke, but the absurdity of its premise offers a critique of the notion that some rape victims are responsible for their rapes, that there are ways of dressing that ask for rape. If we think about the location of the discomfort that accompanies the pleasure of the rape joke, we begin to see what differentiates jokes about rape and jokes about rape culture. In the former, it is the assailed who is laid bare as victim and as hearer. In the latter, it is the assailant who is laid bare. It is an exposure of the conditions under which rape is normalized. Freud, in understanding the joke, any joke, as a staging of a response 
to an assault offers us the teller and the listener. The response of the listener for Freud is as significant as the offering of the teller. Recall that the listener in laughing at the rape joke is, quote, laughing as though he were the spectator of an act of sexual aggression, unquote. Thus, the choreography of the joke contains two people but three positions, assaulter, assaulted, and spectator. The discomfort elicited by the rape joke revolves around the undecidability of that triangulation of the three positions distributed, distributed among only two bodies. The drama and comedy of the broken jug fun functions similarly. Which of those three people in the room broke the jug and who saw it happen and who was not telling? If, according to Freud, we are laughing at aggression when we laugh at the rape joke, are we necessarily positioning ourselves on the side of violence if we laugh? And where are we attempting to place ourselves if we do not? Can rape jokes be funny at all is the question. This is a line from Patricia Lockwood's poem, Rape Joke. The question of whether or not the rape joke can be funny announces itself in the first and last words of the line, then negates itself as a question with a period at the line's end. The poem begins, the rape joke is that you were 19 years old. The rape joke is that he was your boyfriend. The rape joke, it wore a goatee, a goatee. The voice of the poem tells the story of a rape in which each detail is offered under the sign of rape joke. The rape joke is that you've been drinking wine coolers. Wine coolers, who drinks wine coolers? People get, who get raped, according to the rape joke. The rape joke is the form that insists on the inseparability of rape and joke. Lockwood turns the joke into the form through which the rape is felt, documented, becomes thinkable, becomes speakable. The poem addresses a you who has been raped, a rape whose lead up and occurrence and aftermath is conveyed through a sequence of lines, each announcing itself as a rape joke. No line bears any resemblance to the joke form. No condensation, no setup, no punchline. Lockwood does not bring the funny. Lockwood turns the rape joke into the rape. But then the poem itself turns and through the act of laughter, the you who is addressed, offering laughter of dissociation or perhaps refusal, she turns the rape into a rape joke. The rape joke is that of course there was blood, which in human beings is so close to the surface. The rape joke is you went home like nothing happened and laughed about it the next day and the day after that, and when you told people you laughed, and that was the rape joke. The poet ends where she begins. What is the rape joke? Quote, the rape joke is that this is just how it happened. The rape joke is that the next day he gave you pet sounds. No, really, pet sounds. He said he was sorry and he gave you pet sounds. Come on, that's a little bit funny. Admit it. This language of admission and its imperative case would seem to return us to the realm of the juridical. Admit that this is funny. Admit that you find it so. The reader has to be cajoled toward that confession. Come on. Come on. That's a little bit funny. The speaker offers a reading of the gift, finding it a little bit funny, and giving the reader permission to find it funny too. Pet sounds? The Beach Boys? Really? And yet, in that starkness, of those last two words couched in the imperative case, admit it, she invokes just the sort of admission that is withheld in sexual assaults and invoking the desire so frequently expressed by the survivors of sexual assault. What they want is an admission that the rapist did indeed rape them. The end of Lockwood's poem, like the end of the broken jug, would seem to suggest that the comedy and the violence can exist simultaneously, neither canceling out the other. And then I have some questions for Katrine, which maybe I'll take up over here rather than declaiming from the podium. Um, so I have maybe, I have three questions and maybe I'll just throw them all out there and then we can dive in wherever you like. Um, the first one is, um, 
if we accept the reading of Adam as queer or trans, uh, what do we do with that, uh, with that reading next to either the charge of a sexual assault or the possibility of his desiring of Eve? So I'm just wondering, can we have our queer reading and our feminist critique both? And in order to have that, can we, should we, might we parse, if not fully disentangle, gender from sexuality as they emerge in the character of Adam and the play? Um, and the second question I had um, was about that, that uh, reading of, of Adam as queer and trans. Um, I'm now utterly convinced by the significance of that, uh, the extended remix, remix, those sort of two minutes of, of nothing. Um, and you suggest that nothing in the text prevents us from, uh, from reading that as a moment when he wants to have her, uh, when he wants to be her, not to have her, uh, which, which seems true enough to me. But there's also the claim that Adam participates in gay culture. Uh, and I noticed that you put an ellipsis in your own reading in the paper <laughs> that had to be skipped. So I just, I just wanted to hear about what, about what, what is residing in that in that ellipsis, because the because the claim that he's participating in gay culture seems to be a claim of a different order. So I wanted to think about the relation between a queer character, a queer culture, and a queer reading. Um, yeah. Well, maybe that maybe that's enough. Okay. Three turned into two. Three. Well, that's the, well very, uh, for, that's very Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Somehow it divided in between two layers. Good. Um, yeah, sure. I, I cut out. I, I, I have a okay. I, I have a reading of the of the the scene, this exchange between Walter and Adam. Um, it sort of again evolves around his the wounds in his head, um, and it's surrounded by these. Um, um, Adam trying to, in a way, bribe Walter with um, by offering him wine and, and good cheese and all this, and um, prefacing or not bribe, not I mean, you can't bribe somebody with cheese, but um, <laughs> but sort of make him, you know, set the scene, make him comfortable for this, you know, this conversation, um, and all these allusions to. Uh, wine and cheese I read as um, sort of evidence, as it were, for, you know, knowledge that is transferred via these, you know, the, um, these objects and these, like, a uh, certain taste. Uh, silk is mentioned, too. It's all very it's like dandy illusions. And then, um, then it's, uh, it's prefaced by um, Adam saying, uh, see, you know, other people need to share these kind of things with their family. We, as, a, as this reputable bachelors, and the word is Hagestolz, and that is definitely a word that, like, not unlike, I mean, like bachelor to a certain extent, but even stronger, a word that signif signifies I mean, yeah. somebody who, for a reason, is not married. Um, so preface that. And then, and, then, and then this whole exchange about the wounds I read as, um, you know, he has a wound in front and a wound in the back. So there's a lot to be done about the before and after, from, from, from the front and behind. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I read it as, Sort of a discussion about a, about a, the possibility of a sex act between them. Obviously, a wound. So anyway, um, but that's more close reading of this text. I take your point that there's a difference, of course, between um, uh, desire, uh, gay desire, and um, and this possible trans trans expression. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, 
the other question, so yes, that's precise. And I'm re thank you very much for offering this response and bringing out the feminist, um, offering the, the feminist take on, on the text I focused. Mine was not, not very feminist, I suppose. But um, how can we keep both in play? And I mean, my answer to this is precisely this, the, the structure, the, stru the structure that I call Mackel. Mm -hmm. um, so that we have these layers and one interpretation doesn't cancel out the other. Um, it is at, it, the, 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 the layers also don't form some sort of you know, harmonious whole. They're at odds with one another. So the fact that gay desire, trans um, interest, um, and feminist critique, which clearly is there very strongly too. I mean, the fact that this variant is just attached is another version of, um, uh, um, as you so nicely mentioned, Eve being um, censored, right? Her, her, her thing. So now I lost my train of thought, but all these are different, so they're incongruent, and they don't actually, you can't, you cannot, um, you cannot aufheben them into <laughs> a, 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 a unity. You that can't. they're entangled doesn't mean that they are unified. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, so that's the point, and that's sort of a clear point. Can we hear, hear from the audience? Thoughts? Yeah, should we you, open it? Wanna... Yeah, to, to question, comment, thought. Oh, great. Thank you, Laura. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, Simon. My, my question is not the, this is really like a, a question of uh, interest because, um, Catherine, uh, you mentioned that uh, the gender norms that were historically introduced during Clyde's time, and I was, I was just really interested in hearing a bit more um, about that, what happened at that time, and then what happens in these, uh, in these scenes. In, in, um, I mean, this, this, is a, this is a drama that plays uh, where there's, as far as I remember, these, also these, these courtroom scenes, of course, or the, or the, or the judge uh, present. So, I was, I'm wondering what you think that Klaas is doing with kind of these legal dimensions uh, and how this relates to what's happening um, in terms of gender norms that are, uh, as you suggested, introduced during that time. Uh, yeah, so I, I, this is based on Tom McCurse and other people's work, um, um, you know, that in somewhere in the 18th century, maybe earlier, it's uh, not, you know, there's, it's, again, the, the exact, it's very smudge, like the exact temporality is not, it cannot be really defined. Um, um, we move in the West from uh, the, what Lecour calls the one flesh model, where there's only one sex, really, and there are different versions, you know, more perfect, less perfect version um, of this one sex to the two sex model. And with a two sex and then two gender and gender, then, like, you know, with the sort of scientific re revolution based on um, the body, why is in the one flesh model? That's not, it's a cosmological version. Um, um, we have, okay, so we have this like st this strong, uh, or we get this strong um, link between <coughs> gender, gender roles, and and the body, and we that it's defined, it's rooted in there supposedly, but of course it's historically new, so it cannot be rooted in there. 
Um, and also the compulsion to, to, sort of, to complementarity and, and therefore heteronormativity. So um, uh, and that means that this claim about the gay culture is also, it's a little bit, I mean, in a way we don't need a gay culture of, before that because um, things are much more fluid anyways. And only once that, that, that new notion of gender and uh, sex um, emerges, um, this sort of gay culture needs to develop in secret or you know, with these codified signifiers. So we can see that at that point. Um, um, I think in Germany, and then I stop with historical stuff. Um, in Germany, you, know, you see in the 18th century, even with Goethe and and also the romantics, but the, with Goethe, it's very, still you have a lot of sort of gender fluidity, but it's all he sort of um, pushes it into the youth, and then you grow up and then you become a, you know, uh, a real man. Uh, Hegel, the same. But, um, and with the romantics, you have a lot of um, experimentation, but it's the experimentation, and also there's like you know, some trans identification, but it's totally based on um, opposite, opposite genders, opposite sexes, that notion. And with Kleist, I think, yeah, the, the, so Kleist is interesting to me because it's, it's very weird and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't line up at all. Um, and around 1806, so really with the Napoleonic Wars, we get a much more 1806, because um, big battle at Vienna that the Prussians lose, um, we get <coughs> you know, people who have been accepted. This famous case is Johannes Müller, historian, as you know, gay, but nobody talked. I mean, it wasn't an issue. Suddenly becomes gay and is ostracized because he also sided with the French. So this sort of nationalism and um, and uh, homophobia becomes you know, entangled into one figure. And that's when it becomes really politically dangerous to be gay, actually. Or not to be gay, I mean, it becomes possible to accuse somebody of gayness because it also means you're not, you know, you're French or you're, um, I mean, not national, probably national. You had your hand up. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you so much for these uh, readings. I, I really can't speak too much to Kleist, but <clears throat> I think the, the metaphor of brokenness is super interesting. And I, I would just like to hear more about, you know, broken relationship to this double negative of the undisentangled. Um, and there's two metaphors there, really, because brokenness and entangled are two different things. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I wonder about both of them for as metaphors for identity. Um, you know, brokenness as in you know this this uh, understanding of virginity as something that is lost and then never can be regained. Once broken, it's always broken. And then brokenness as a relationship to masquerade or as split identities. Those kinds of things that no matter how hard we try to put the play back together again, it kind of doesn't work, you know. So um, I guess I, I find that really provocative as a way of, of thinking about a sort of avant la lettre queerness. Um, and, and I guess I'd like to hear more about that. And I feel, Gail, maybe in your some of your um, rape jokes as well, or, or if we go to Nanette, mm -hmm. the, the, the Hannah Gadsby monologue is is both a piece about brokenness and it keeps breaking with the genre, right? And she keeps refusing to be funny sometimes and at other times um, breaks, you know, breaks the fourth wall or all, all kinds of things. So I wonder if, you know, just a conversation about brokenness. Yeah, yeah, yeah and I definitely, I don't want to stay with Kleist because I mean, I, I, he's super interesting and I think he's super, he gives us a logic and a structure that's very relevant, but I want to sort of, it's relevant to us now, I think. So. Okay. But brokenness, yeah. And again, I will go talk about the text. Um, uh, um, 
uh, yeah, thank you for pointing out that figure. It's super obvious the, that the, um, that sort of method, right? The brokenness is method here. Mm -hmm. And Martha Rall start, starts this whole, you know, her sort of complaint uh, by, I mean, for a like, very drawn out complaint about the fact that this, this jug cannot be put together again. It cannot. You know, it, it cannot, and which also plays on the word of you know, it can, it, something is, you know, it cannot be un, this case cannot be decided because to, to decide is also a cut, but it cannot be, be. I don't know. She plays on this word, so the cutting, the breaking, um, without ever um, being able to sort of create some sort of either solution or harmonious whole again um, it's very important I mentioned also the, um, the this sort of um, movement of Rubre into the into the chamber and as if his you know his what is that uh, the, 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 the air from him breaking the door like the um, pushes the jug down, but it falls into the into the room. And I read that. I mean, it's a, it's, it's it suggests causality and sort of a tight link, but then it it it, it messes with that because it, it falls in the opposite direction. And I read that as structurally similar to there's another word um, in the play. Um, Adam says that he will fill out this la this 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 hole, this void on this on the shine um, in Frakturschrift. Um, and that's what is that in English? It's, um, hmm? Cursive. No, it's not cursive. It's the other thing. It's it's a script, but it's um, it. What it, it's an old script and it has a name in English. Hmm? No, it's not calligraphy. Um, I should have looked it up. Um, Okay, but it's this German, you just this Ger I mean, when you think of German, old German letters, you know, that, mm. this is what I mean. So it's not Roman script where you can like write without um, lifting the pen, but you have to constantly lift the pen and apply it again, or the quill or whatever it was in those times. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a writing of bricks. You constantly break and move in the other direction. So I think it's definitely very much um, method here, and yeah, as you say, I re absolutely re read it as a sort of queer logic structure, aesthetics. Well, I think one of the things your close reading really convincingly shows is that this jug gets broken. The jug and the Eve and Eve both get broken as kind of collateral damage, and Adam and Ruprecht sort of crashing toward each other, yeah. right? So um, I think the, the brokenness as um, the thing that just happens when they're engaged in other things. But then also the, the, that it is both so central to the, like, like it's called the broken jug, but also so marginal and, as you say, like badly metaphorical and, yeah. and all this. So. Can I say something about Nanette? About Nanette. Um, I just think that comment is exactly right, right? That the thing that was so arresting about that performance and I think why it became so uh, huge was uh, exactly the insistence on breaking genre and form and, um, uh, and the fact that, it, that it, it, it is so generically undecidable, I think is what makes it uh, really, really compelling. So yeah, that just seems exactly right to me. But really to sort of, sorry, to move to the present tense a little more, I mean, we, we barely, this is coming back to what you offered, um, we, we barely moved a step um, from like 200 years ago to, you know, tiny step that's not a step from A to B, from Judge Adam to Brett. Um, and, 
and 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 I really appreciate um, so another judge, and I mm. appreciate your your sort of more you know feminist take on it, and 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 bringing it to comedy and the joke, and in um, Lazy Ford's um, um, testimony, you know, when she was asked what do you remember most, mm -hmm. it was the laughter. Right. The laughter between the men. Right. Um, Thanks. Those that they were both great. Um, I wanted to ask more about that. Maybe what you'd call it is the activity status of the objects that you were describing, like the jug. Um, Gail brought out more the thing about the wig, um, the jug, the wig. Did you say a goat? A goat thing on the oven? Uh, yeah, it, it's yeah. like it's yeah. like a like a decorative the ornament. ornament. Yeah. Okay, um, the the goat ornament, um, and then the waistband, the trousers, and um, and did the, I, I'll get to the question in a second, but I just want to ask for a clarification. Did you say um, about broken that it could be cracked or leap? Spring. Oh, sp what, what was the two? Springen can mean leap or crack. Leap or crack, yeah, which is interesting to me for the, where I'm going, because to be cracked is to be passive receiver, and to leap is to be very active. So um, when you used the, when you talked about the waistband, trousers, and me, all three we fall, which was a fantastic line, um, you read that in terms of a kind of n narcissistic onanism mm -hmm. thing, right? Um, but um, I wonder if you, if you see in Kleist some signs also of, uh, of a, of a more active status for these objects that are more, more parallel to the to the people, and the um, the way in which um, there's a maybe you could call it like a, the magic they're magical objects where they do things they're not just passive but they're active as well, and if you saw that happening there too, and one of the things that can't be un one of the things that is undisentangled is the differences between the difference between people and their alleged things. So if you had any thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think that so in terms of my reading has to do with the metaleptic quality of the language. OK, you, I, I don't, I don't even know what the metaleptic quality is. Yeah, so maybe just say that. Um, yeah, so I guess another version of my question is, are these things more than metaphorically active? Exactly. They are metaphorically active, but is it, there's an, are there other senses in which they're active? Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so metalepsis, I mean, has a lot of different meanings. One, one I used, um, one is a narrative meaning where, like, um, uh, um, um, levels of narration are 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 conflated, or some some, you know, uh, a, a, a moment uh, like the, the narrator is suddenly in the scene. So that's one, one form of metalepsis, okay. but for this, more important is the rhetorical notion of metalepsis, and there are, again, there's like different, different, um, different versions of rhetorical metalepsis, but what's important to me here is that um, um, it's always like a very circuitous, like um, 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 replacement of one word for another, it's like very long, sort of a chain of replacements, um, one, one figure for another, and often a lesser figure for a metaphor. So in this case, I think with Kleist, it's really um, the, 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 the sort of sliding of metaphor into literal speech. Yes, yeah. And so, and it's both, so, and again, it's incongruent, it, but both, so both of them happen at the same time, are there at the same time. It's both a metaphor, and it's a bad metaphor, meaning that he uses it literally. Um, so, so the drug, obviously, I mean, it's a really bad sort of um, common, yeah. you know, barely metaphor for Virginia or for the you know um, female parts. Um, and um, with these other things that you mentioned, um, 
yes, uh, yes, they do have they do have agency, and um, perhaps I didn't focus on that so much. But yeah, brought up the wig, um, the wig that then punishes, the wig punishes the 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 um, the judge. There's no human. Uh, agent that uses, who uses the wig to, um, um, you know, to, 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 to beat Adam, but he's like, he's chased out and then the wig just sort of flaps on his back and that's clearly, I mean, it's also getting a bad, bad figure. Um, with the waistband and the trousers, of course, it's also inter uh, interesting. Yeah, you can read it as an actual three sum. It's a yeah, sum. yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, that gets disturbed a bit by the fact, um, or at least my, in my reading, then gets disturbed by the fact that these are at that time uh, masculine uh, parts of the masculine attire. Um, so who knows how? you know, how pleasurable it is yeah. for Adam to be sort of have the threesome with the two other guys. Yes, <laughs> two other guys, but then it might work with, with my other reading. So again, I mean, lay, layers. Uh, uh, Thank you. Um, thank you for that. I was wondering um, if you could say a bit more about the the figure of the devil in relationship to um, enlightenment and truth. Um, and I was thinking, in you just reminded me in um, a different Christ text, um, the Marquise von O, where when the um, Kant appears at the end and reveals that he is the man who raped the Marquise, um, and she says. I was prepared to marry a monster, but not the devil. And in this scene, it's like the devil is the one who, he, he has, I don't know exactly if you could say he takes responsibility, but he admits at least he appears. Um, which seems to be a different relationship of like the, the, the figure of the devil to the admitting to a sexual assault. And I was just wondering if you could say a bit more about um, Adam in relation to that, if, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and we have to say that the uh, Marquis of is also is also a rape story or, mm -hmm. or a rape joke possibly. It's not very funny. yeah. Um, but the but the whole in this in that case that the confession is sort of what the entire play is is building to in in that in that moment yeah. Uh -huh. right. Yeah. Uh, well, it is really actually also a joke because the premise of the story is right. that. Um, the Marquise finds herself pregnant, pregnant, but doesn't know how this could have possibly happened, and puts um, an um, what's it called announcement in the newspaper, an, uh, an announcement. Right. Let's say, sorry, my English is lacking today. Um, in the newspaper, looking for the father who right. must have been the rapist, right? Because she was un unconscious um, when this happened, obviously. She has no memory of it. So that's a pretty bad joke. But also interesting, because she's super active and, um, <laughs> um, and just... Well, she actually is the ellipsis in the middle of that story, right? Because she herself does not know. Right. Yeah. Ex yeah. But to the devil... Um, so at the... If I remember correctly, um, she says to him, I want, there's something about him, like him switching from angel to devil. I can't quite remember the line, but um, it's important to me that, that um, yeah, so she says, well, you seemed like an angel because he's a, a count. Oh, because he was a count, this was a count of the opposite. You know, it's also war, always war situations in, in class. So the count uh, of the enemy, you know, the enemy forces, a count, not the count, 
um, rescued her from the flames. So he seemed to be an angel. And then after this whole story, she realized that he was her rapist. And so he turned into the devil. Um, but that the switch is so, you know, readily possible in Kleist um, is important to me be, like I, because I think that he, um, yeah, he makes it very hard to, as I said, disidentify with the devil or with the villain. They're, 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 you know, they're, all these characters have something devilish and something angel-like in mm -hmm. them, and, and maybe also the activity and passivity are not opposed. It, it's not a logic of opposition, it's a logic of incongruence. Uh, thank you, that was... Fantastic, I must say, I, I enjoyed it incredibly. Um, this may be a non sequitur question, but uh, my memory from reading Kleist in graduate school was of the incredible energetics of the text and the compression and volatility, actually, of the uh, whole narrative scene. And it strikes me that uh, in Gale's treatment, um, there was a much more uh, direct uh, engagement, shall we say, with the energetics and the management of energy in the, in the text, obviously with the clear uh, psychodynamic aspects, for, for example, of the use of, the, um, of Freud's uh, joke. And the way energy, or shall we say meaning, but meaning as energy, gets transformed, uh, which is the real thermodynamic sort of insight, let's say. And um, I'm just wondering whether or not, the, you know, also the Springen idea, I suppose, it tells us that an object does have that volatility. That's to say it's a bursting, you could say, also of the, of the jug, or the, how the crack is actually the sign of attainable mm -hmm. energy, material energy. So, you know, I'm a refugee from um, uh, literary studies, actually. And um, uh, for me, that was the escape, was away from, shall we say, the semantics of meaning, but a little bit toward uh, the dynamics. And I'm just wondering whether you guys have some thoughts uh, about that. Maybe it was a non sequitur after all. No, 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 absolutely not. I, I, I think it actually um, offers a, 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 a new, a better answer to Jane. <laughs> because um, I think it's, um, um, the, the, these objects here ha all have, an energy, and it's not. It's of course the 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 writing style, as you say, class writing style, but also um, also the uh, like. I still took the objects too much as objects, the, ma the yeah, as objects or stable, um, and it's really, it's really that there's this energy and the that and that's the agency then the leaping the cracking the bursting also and funke springt über so a literal electric an electric current um, springt can uh, springen or or uh, an insight you know the the point of the story springt um, and funke springt über um, I guess his bells Sprung as well. <laughs> what, say that again, sorry. Uh, well, I'd rather not, if you don't mind. I know, uh, that's why I apologize. His bowels. His bowels, the bowels as well. Yeah, they, so, um, exactly, it's a, that's definitely a, an eruption. Um, and that's also about smell. Um, there's a whole thing about, sm like he, the smell, of course, of the devil, but the smell, the, 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 because of that bowel movement <laughs> or explosion, he, 
he can be traced, the devil supposedly can be traced back to the courthouse. <laughs> um, and there is, yeah, energy is extremely important. Um, I point, I worked more with the other side that's also absolutely there. I mean, um, when you read Kleist, yes, you're, you are yourself sort of, I mean, m I mean, it's a different kind of, you, he doesn't move, it's not, an, it's not an, uh, um, a movement based on, you know, sentimental identification, but it's an act, you know, it's really like your sort of, the transmission of energy, but there's also this other side, the stalling, this is constant going back to the same thing, and something has already been made clear, and again we have another scene that sort of does the same and, and, uh, differently, and so there's this also this stalling movement. Yeah. I just have a follow-up question about that. So I think the, that the energy of, of the, the text and the way that it sort of like um, careens between the characters and it sort of pulls, pulls one along as yeah. a reader, yeah. right? Um, and also like the, the, the sort of the repetition giving this kind of forward momentum. Um, there was one moment in your reading that I wanted to quarrel with and that's when you said, we have to take Adam at his word and his denials because we have no way to judge, right? Yeah. Um, but it seems like as readers of the text and when we're going along, we, we do. We, like, we judge. We, we, we do judge. We're sort of carried along by yeah. the vociferousness of Absolutely. his denials, which the other characters, uh, like, we, we never believe those denials, right? Even when he's first right. saying, oh my gosh, what happened to you? Where's your wig? What's that wound on your head? And he, like, spins this great big long story. Yeah. But we never believe him, right? We're, we're, we, we never feel that we have to be yeah. Switzerland in that moment, right? <laughs> Oh, but I didn't want to say uh, we, we have no way to judge. Um, we have no criterion, um, but right? no measure against which to judge whether these crazy stories are crazy or mm -hmm. because sometimes it turns out, whoa, there's actually, you know, they're corroborated. So does that mean that all of them are right but, or true and, or all of them? Uh -huh. Some of them, or what, what, what's the deal here? So we have no measure, but we judge constantly, and that's how we are. That's why. That's how we cannot say no to the to the question. Do you want to hear a, a rape joke? Mm. So you're saying you're saying we are, part, we are the judge. We are Adam. So the so that so the the kind of rhetorical people. excesses of uh, particularly of these denials, which make us suspicious. You're saying that that's that's part of what's being played with here. Totally. Yeah, yeah and that's the violence that Kleist exerts, I mean, yeah, like, does to us. And, 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 and I think it's, I mean, there's definitely, he definitely is just like violent for violence sake. <laughs> but he, there's also a, a point to it that um, you cannot, you cannot do, you cannot sort of Assume an ethical position. You cannot be the good judge mm. when, definitely not when reading Kleist, and I would say maybe that's a generalizable point. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> we've run out of time, but thank you so much, Katrin and Gail.